Yes, thank you again, and um, welcome to everybody. Uh, thanks to everyone that's been to the previous sessions. They've been really well attended, uh, and we've been you know, really grateful to you for giving up your time to attend these as well. Um, in a moment, I'm going to pass over to my planning policy colleague, Nadim, who's going to give some uh, give some context and background, and then uh, uh, Nadim will be passing over to my colleague, Anna, um, for one of the main sections of today. Um, Nadim, I'm going to uh, ask you to unmute, and Anna as well, over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction and welcome everybody to uh, today's webinar on the local plan. Um, today's focus is on the theme of natural environment and specifically biodiversity, uh, the green and blue infrastructure, which we'll, we'll look to cover in that. Okay, so the purpose uh, is to, to give you a brief background to the local plan progress and where we are on that. Um, and as I said, the theme for today's session is the natural environment chapter in the document. Um, so starting with the policy context, as you'll all be aware, and uh, from previous webinars as well, the planning process in England is, is planning is plan led. And what that means in practice is that at the very top of the hierarchy is the government's policy and planning, which it has set out through the national planning policy framework in amongst everything else. And what this does, it sets out what the government expects local plans to include uh, and uh, what areas that um, we and policies that we should be developing in our local plan. Now, Specifically to today's webinar, paragraphs 174 onwards set out what the local plan should seek to do in um, through its plan when it's seeking to contribute to and enhance the natural and local environment. And just one of the bullet points in, in that guidance for us is that the local plan should and the policies within it should seek to protect and enhance the valued landscapes, sites of biodiversity or geological value in soils um, in a way that, that are set out in, in that framework. And paragraphs 179 through to 182 deal specifically with habitat and biodiversity. And they, there is an expectation um, <clears throat> that the local plan policies will seek to protect and enhance biodiversity and geodiversity. Um, I thought it might be helpful just to sort of take a step back into the local plan making process and spell out where we are in our policy, in, in our progress. Um, so as you can see from the slide on the screen, uh, we are at the stage where um, we are looking to develop a draft local plan in the spring of next year and at the moment the consultation is on the preferred options and policy directions and um, we will then move on from from there as the uh, diagram on the slide shows moving towards the right to adopting a local plan once it's been through examination so we are at the start of the journey of preparing our new new local plan and so a lot of the, the policies are not set out in, in much detail, that will be done through further iterations of the plan. So having set the policy context for both the plan making and today's theme, I'm going to hand over to Anna, who will take you through the policies that are in the policy directions that are being set out through the consultation document and those that we envisage we will take forward through the local plan um, draft version next year. Okay, Anna. Thank you. Can you go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, so the district's natural environment is one of its greatest assets and it supports a range of habitats, um, species, other features that contribute to biodiversity or its geodiversity value. 
uh, vital parts of the ecosystem are the soils, the rivers, the wider water environment. And in addition to protecting and restoring nature for nature, uh, the natural environment also contributes to enhancing the quality of life for residents, uh, for workers and visitors, and helps to promote uh, a healthy living environment and social inclusion. And as well as our natural capital assets, they have a key role in tackling the two huge environmental crises that we face, that's climate change and the devastating loss of biodiversity. So through the local plan, we want to put the environment at the heart of all development to ensure and deliver, to enhance and deliver biodiversity net gains rather than detrimentally impacting on our environmental assets, including our designated national sites, uh, landscape character in the district, uh, biodiversity and water quality. Next slide, please. So it's, it's worth just mentioning and briefly setting out the Environment Act, which received Royal Assent in 2021. It makes provision for targets, plans and policies for improving the natural environment in four priority areas, that being um, air quality, biodiversity, water and the source efficiency and waste reduction. So there's two measures from this Act, which are just key to the local plan, which I'll touch on today. And that's the requirements for biodiversity net gain and local nature recovery strategies. So the Act makes a measurable biodiversity net gain on development sites mandatory, and this will ensure habitats for wildlife are enhanced with a minimum of 10% increase in habitat value for wildlife compared with the pre-development baseline. And we'll discuss this a bit further in the context of the local plan and, and under policy NE2 uh, just shortly. And another key area for the local plan is the int introduction of local nature recovery strategies. These will be prepared at county scale, and they provide a spatial blueprint for where and how nature recovery networks can be created um, through improving, expanding and better connecting areas for wildlife on the ground. So East Sussex County Council will be leading on the East Sussex and Brighton and Hove nature recovery strategy. And this will be prepared through a process that brings local people, communities and organisations together to identify the priorities and the opportunities for nature's recovery locally. So this will include agreeing the best places to help nature recover, such as plant trees, create woodlands, restore our grasslands, uh, mitigate flood risks, create green spaces for local people to enjoy. And once prepared, that local nature recovery strategy will be used to help guide efforts and resources locally to improve, expand and better connect our habitats. Next slide, please. So the local plan policies proposed to support the district's overall aims in relation to the natural environment are NE1, which is a policy on green and blue infrastructure, NE2 on biodiversity, NE3 around protection of landscape qualities, and NE4, which is around creating a clean and healthy environment. So the policies that propose, we're proposing have been informed by a number of evidence documents which have been completed to date including those listed on the slide, landscape character assessment, landscape sensitivity study, biodiversity study, geodiversity study, and an open space assessment. And um, I'll talk briefly about those in a moment. There's also the study, green and blue infrastructure study, which is still ongoing due to be completed next year. Can you go to the next slide, please. So the Biodiversity study that carries out a high level biodiversity assessments, including details of potential constraints and opportunities on some potential strategic allocations and land surrounding settlements within the plan area. And they use, use these assessments to consider the suitability in terms of biodiversity impacts of sites and settlements for future development. Um, the biodiversity study also looks at the requirements for biodiversity next, net gain on development sites and whether there may be a need for off-site delivery of biodiversity net gain in the district um, in order to facilitate that delivery of development on sites that cannot deliver their own net gain. So to do this, the study sets out seven typologies, which have then been developed to broadly represent development types, which may be expected in the district in the plan period. So these are small, medium, large greenfield residential sites, large or small brownfield residential, um, offices and large housing or mixed use sites and solar sites and the assessment of the typologies estimates the BNG um, biodiversity net gain credits required to ensure at least a 10% net gain in biodiversity and the outcomes of this part of the study can then be used to estimate the total number of off-site 
biodiversity net gain credits to plan for when considering um, site allocations in the new local plan. So another aspect of the study is the justification for Lewis to consider a greater degree of net gain above that mandatory 10%. The study does set out there is some ju there is justification for Lewis to seek a minimum a minimum of twenty percent biodiversity net gain where that is feasible and it should be um, achievable. The final part of the study looks at areas where habitats and key wildlife corridors could be enhanced by identifying areas of potential biodiversity net gain provision. So next slide, please. So the landscape studies, we've got the landscape character assessment that sets out seven distinct landscape character areas um, in the plan area. Um, that plan area is the plan area, so the district outside of the South Dallas National Park. The landscape character assessment describes those the key characteristic key characteristics of the landscape character areas, and then sets out guidelines for management and for development in those areas. So although the South Downs National Park is outside the local plan area, the National Park landscape is of great importance. We are required to have regard to the purposes of the National Park, including to conserve and enhance the natural beauty, the wildlife and cultural heritage of the area. And the landscapes described in the South Downs own landscape character assessment are strongly interrelated to those in the Lewis plan area. Um, a particular, particular importance is the South Downs National Park viewsheds and the South Downs International Dark Sky Reserve designated in 2016. The Lewis Landscape Sensitivity Study then looks at landscape and visual sensitivity of defined sites and parcels of land surrounding settlements to different types of development. The development typologies are considered that comprise of small, medium, large scale residential small and large scale employment sites, um, strategic mixed use sites and solar development. And the sensitivity assessment is based upon identifying the landscape and the visual attributes of the sites and assessment areas, which are then most likely to be impacted by the development types. The study provides landscape sensitivity ratings based on the sensitivity for the different development types and guidance for mitigation for each area assessed. So next slide, please. So the geodiversity, this is a range of rocks, fossils, minerals, soils, landforms, natural processes that go up to that make up the Earth's landscape and its structure. The geodiversity underpins biodiversity. Um, often where biodiversity areas are located, they're linked with particular geological formations. So in the geodiversity study, local sites of geological interest are identified and they're assessed according to natural uh, national guidance. And uh, in the plan area, there are two geological special sites of scientific interest and three other geological conservation review sites. The study provides a review of the level of protection of the sites assessed and some possible enhancements. We've also, um, these policies are also influenced by the open space strategy and um, open space assessment, which presents an assessment of types of open space uh, such as green spaces, parks, gardens, allotments, outdoor sports facilities, um, in terms of current provision and future requirements, and uh, a quality and value assessment was carried out to recommend which open spaces could benefit from improvements. Um, finally, we have the Green and Blue Infrastructure Study that's currently being undertaken by consultants, and the study looks at green and blue infrastructure in the district, describes the existing summarizes the opportunities and challenges for protection, for the creation and maintenance and enhancement of the green and blue infrastructure in the plan area. That study, um, a study is currently ongoing, it's due to be completed next year. Next slide, please. So the uh, consultation sets out preferred policy direction for green and blue infrastructure, point in policy NE1. Um, just to start with, what is green and blue infrastructure? That's it's basically a network of multifunctional green space and water environments that sustain our ecosystems. These can be urban or re rural, and are capable of delivering a wide range of environmental, economic, health, and well-being benefits for nature and the climate. The GBI network can include street trees, uh, green roofs, 
our walls, uh, parks, private gardens, allotments, um, sustainable drainage systems uh, through to wildlife areas, woodlands, wetlands, um, natural flood management functioning at the local or landscape scale. And then there's linear um, GBI, which can include roadside verges, green bridges, field margins. Um, the green infrastructure improvements can be delivered as part of new development by planning system. Um, upgrading of existing green and blue infrastructure and retrofitting of new um, infrastructure in areas where the provision is identified as being poor. So um, with the GBI network, the aim is to develop multifunctionality, uh, linking the built up area with the natural environment, delivering benefits for nature, the environment, climate, health and well-being, and even economic prosperity. So the preferred local plan policy will identify and protect the existing GBI network, linking with the nature recovery network discussed earlier. Um, we'll identify areas where there is potential for the enhancement or restoration of existing uh, green and blue infrastructure or the provision of new uh, green and blue infrastructure. Um, the policy would not support development that would undermine the functional integrity of that GBI network. And the, the policy will also require all development proposals to include um, appropriate green and blue infrastructure to the, the type and the scale and the location of the development and the development site. Um, and finally, to support the migration of species between habitats, the preferred local plan promotes the reconnection of habitats across the plan area through compulsory habitat connection uh, connectivity in new developments. So, for example, if a site overlaps two identified habitats, all the same habitats that are fragmented. Local plan policy could set out mandatory requirements for the design of the site to specifically include green or blue corridors to connect those habitats. Next slide, please. Um, just before we talk about preferred policy NE2, which is about biodiversity, it's probably helpful to just set out um, a bit about uh, BNG um, and the understanding of it. It's uh, an approach that aims to leave biodiversity in a measurably better place than before the development took place. So the old system talked um, more about no net loss of biodiversity. Um, that is when you uh, undertake a development and there is no net loss in, in the biodiversity that was there before. Um, but the new mechanism as discussed in the Environment Act or in biodiversity net gain is, um, that's the approach now and that will look at to ensure that habitats are enhanced with a minimum of 10% net gain in value, measured in standard standardized biodiversity units and using an, a national metric. Uh, next slide, please. So, I mean, why do we need BNG? Um, historically, biodiversity loss has been a bit of an afterthought. We're now seeking to reverse this loss, um, not just locally, but nationally. There's also a shift in the public sentiment. There's more awareness of the issues around biodiversity and people are valuing their local parks, nature, spaces more. And this links with health and well-being um, priorities and providing healthy places that people want to live in. Next slide, please. So in practice, um, biodiversity net gain, it doesn't change the legal protections. They stay the same. Um, before development commences on site, we need to know and we need to capture what the base conditions are on the ground for biodiversity. The developer would undertake assessments to measure the habitats and provide a forward plan for the biodiversity net gain. Um, and biodiversity net gain is not going to be delivered by the council. It has to be a partnership approach with everyone from the environment agency or um, other strategic partners playing their part. And next slide, please. So preferred policy and two sets out the local plan response to biodiversity net gain. So all development should ensure the protection, conservation and enhancement of biodiversity. If harm cannot be avoided, then such harm should be adequately mitigated. And where it cannot be adequately mitigated, then as a last resort, harm must be compensated for. And where it cannot be compensated for, then planning permission should be refused. So even though the requirement for 10% biodiversity net gain is mandatory in national policy, as we've discussed, a locally specific policy will be able to set out local priorities and strategies to ensure the BNG, that biodiversity net gain contributes to wider nature recovery plans and our local objectives. It will help to ensure that the right habitats are provided in the right places, including locally specific biodiversity net gain policy in the local plan. This will link 
that local plan with other strategic objectives and improve the overall placemaking for the district. So the preferred local plan policy is proposing to require development to achieve a minimum of 10% net gain and up to 20% biodiversity net gain. Um, whilst the biodiversity study sets out some justification for the requirement for a higher level of biodiversity net gain, there is further evidence and work required to evidence up to 20% uh, biodiversity net gain requirement in the local plan policy, and this includes showing that that requirement is achievable and viable um, and, and still allowing development to come forward. Next slide, please. So, you know, this district contains some high quality and diverse landscapes, including heathlands, river valleys, floodplains, rolling downland, chalk cliffs, shingle beaches, or rural fields, and, and ancient woodlands. The district's valued landscape has been has been recognised through the designation of the South Downs National Park. And whilst, whilst the South Downs National Park Authority have planning responsibility for the park area, Lewis District must ensure that development within the Lewis local plan area does not adversely affect the setting of the park, inclu including key views. Um, and landscape is not static, it changed over time. The geological and natural environment has been changed by human activity and human activity is also influenced by the environment. So the landscape character tells the story of those in, influencing relationships. The protection of the landscape does not mean that development cannot take place, but protection signifies that changes must be managed in such a way that potential adverse impacts are kept to a minimum and that the unique character of the landscape can even be strengthened. So new development will have an impact on the landscape. The new local plan um, aims to steer development where harm can be minimised and the spatial strategy seeks to manage growth in the most sustainable locations to ensure that the most valued and sensitive land is protected. The landscape design policy will require development to reflect local character and distinctiveness and integrate development into its surroundings. Um, the policy will also set out requirements in relation to tree planting, which links with requirements for climate adaptation, carbon capture and cooling. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, policy NE4, this addresses pollution, such as air, soil, noise and light, and should propose specific requirements where appropriate for each um, where relevant. So the preferred policy will set out how development should contribute positive to, positively to the quality of the environment and how development should minimise polluting impacts on existing and future residents to create a clean and healthy environment for all. The preferred policy will require all development proposals to avoid significant adverse impacts on health and the quality of life for residents and quality of the environment from pollutants such as air, soil, noise and light or other pollutants now or in future and mitigate any adverse impact on the health and quality of life for residents and quality of the environment from pollutants and where possible, contribute to the improvement of uh, mentioned quality aspects to help improve health, quality of life and environment. Development, which is both residential and commercial, that may potentially contribute or adversely affect soil quality, air quality, or contribute to noise or light pollution, will only be permitted where it can be demonstrated that development will not have an adverse impact on the use of other land, uh, the health and quality of life of residents or the environment. Um, so next slide, please. So um, this preferred policy is setting out specifically in relation to noise, um, that development would that would expose noise sensitive uses to unacceptable noise levels will not be permitted, and um, further set out that noise sensitive development would only be permitted where it can be demonstrated that users would not be exposed to unacceptable noise disturbance from existing or future uses. Um, in turn, noise generation development will only be permitted where it can be demonstrated that nearby noise sensitive uses, including existing or planned uses, will not be exposed to noise impacts that would adversely affect the use of existing or future users or occupiers. And specifically in relation to light, it is recognised that artificial light has valuable benefits in terms of feelings of safety and allowing longer hours of recreation and sport in some instances. However, artificial light can be a source of annoyance for people. It can have negative impacts on wildlife and the enjoyment of the countryside. The preferred policy will restrict artificial light 
sources in the plan area to those required for working or safety purposes and glare and spillage should be minimised. Policy was set out also that outdoor lighting should be powered by on-site renewable sources where possible. And in addition, developments within the setting of the South Dallas National Park will be required to minimise adverse impacts on the, the uh, South Downs um, International Dark Sky Reserve. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the policy specifically in relation to soils um, will set out how development should deal with contaminated soils. We'll have specific requirements to avoid contamination of any water course or aquifer. A development proposals on a site that is known or suspected to be affected by contamination will only be permitted where the council is certified that all works, including investigation of the nature of the contamination, can be undertaken without escape of contaminants that would cause unacceptable risk to health or the environment. And lastly, the uh, preferred policy specifically in relation to air pollution. Um, generally, the local plan will set out requirements for sustainable travel, uh, developments that support or encourage travel by walking, cycling or public transport, reducing that need to travel by private car will be supported through the sustainable travel policies. This preferred uh, environment policy proposes specific requirements for development that could impact current or potential um, air quality management areas and seeks to address reduction of pollutants in the construction phase. So development proposals which could impact on the current or potential air quality management areas must have regard to any um, air quality action plans and seek improvements in air quality through the implement implementation of measures. And provide mitigation where the development or associated traffic would avert adversely affect any declared area of um, air quality management. And in addition, all applications for development will be required to secure best practice methods to reduce levels of dust and other pollutants arising from the construction and or from the use of completed developments. And this uh, policy will set out requirements for applications in terms of the submission of construction details um, to, to avoid future conditions. Um, so this concludes the uh, just setting out the preferred uh, policies for the natural environment theme. So I will hand you back to Nadine. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, so hopefully you've heard something about what the local plan is is seeking to achieve in terms of the natural environment. Um, how can you get involved? Um, so as you'll be aware, we're doing these webinars as part of the public consultation on this stage of the local plan and um, everything that you've heard today from us is available on the consultation platform which is where we'd also like you to provide your comments um, and you can put comments against um, every policy direction that's in the consultation document what i would like to ask though is that if you can use that consultation portal as the way to provide us your comments. And the reason for that is, is if we are receiving emails and um, comments through the post, then that requires us to, or what we will need to do is then upload those onto the consultation platform. And uh, we will also have to come back to you and ask you a load of questions around uh, GDPR. So if you are able to, um, and you have the capacity, then then I would encourage you to um, use that medium for responding back to the consultation. Um, it also means that um, if the, your your responses will be structured, so we know exactly against which question uh, you you are commenting on. Um, and if you're unable to comment online, then please do contact us, and we'll see if there's an alternative way that we can get you to get your comments onto that portal. The consultation itself is open until the 8th of February, and it is really important that you do uh, provide us with your comments. Um, you know, the, the end product will be a combination of technical studies that we've been uh, using to support the policy direction, but also the, the views um, that we hear from our consultees. Uh, and later on um, in in, in the consultation in early January, we will be looking to host a number of in-person events in various locations in the plan area. 
Um, so do please come back to and um, visit the website for details of where those events will take place. And our final uh, webinar in this series is uh, this Wednesday uh, at the same time at 12 o'clock and uh, using the same medium uh, on, and you can use the same link to, to access that. Um, so that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, the QR code on the screen that you're seeing, you should be able to scan and that takes you straight to the portal. Or if you want to pick it up by the link, um, then that's also uh, an option. So I'll hand back to Bryn. I think, Bryn, this is probably one of the first webinars where we've finished with uh, plenty of time for questions. Thank you very much, Nadim, and, and thank you, Anna, as well. Um, we've um, just had a question from John. Uh, do you expect the new planning, um, sorry, the new national planning policies to impact on the need for local policies uh, in new local plans? And uh, are you confident that the examining the expector will see a need for additional local policies in this area? Um, the, I mean, we, we're we're still in that period where the new national framework hasn't really been bedded down um where so in in terms of that that do we see the plan the local plan and the policies within it being i mean one thing that the, you know nothing's been ruled out from the new national plan framework is the need for local plans so if there is a local justification for those we will continue to try and push those forward and really justify and argue for those through the examination process Thank you, Nazim. Um, the next question is from uh, Councillor Emily O'Brien. Hi, Emily. Um, the council passed a motion asking the planning department to be proactive about asking developers um, at the earliest stages about HGV routing in order to minimise the impact of HGV traffic and pollution as a result of development. Will this practice continue? And or uh, is there any possibility that planning policy, which will of, of planning policy, which will support this approach? If I've understood the question correctly, there, I think what Emily is asking is, can we through the local plan get um, into discussions with potential sites that are being developed, um, so that the the, before the development commences, we have a plan in place for where HGVs will access those sites. Um, I think that is something that we will need to look into as part of the, the negotiations and the development of the plan, so that by the time we're getting to a plan which is being adopted with sites uh, allocated, that we, we have those plans in, process, in, in place uh, and, and a process in place for managing uh, movement from from those sites so it's something that we will uh, certainly take on board and turn take forward okay thank you thank you Nadine. um so next question from john um and and apologies if i, I don't express this in quite the right right way um john saying hopefully the provision of on-site biodiversity net gain will be prioritized um that as i think that's the heart of the question uh and and uh john is asking if he's right to be suspicious when he hears about um off-site biodiversity net gain improvements being provided through um bng credits provided by bng credit brokers um is that something you can come back on nadine um i'm gonna let anna take this one i think she might be in a better place than me to answer anna yeah, I mean, I think essentially the uh, the baseline is that that BNG would be prioritised on site, and and only where it cannot be delivered on site would we consider off site um, BNG, um, and that would have to be on a sort of site by site basis. It's hard to say um, more than that really at this stage. Thank you, Anna. Thanks very much. Um, and a follow up from John is. Um, how will the delivery of on-site biodiversity getting improvements be monitored uh, in the medium term? And does our planning team already have the necessary, necessary capacity? Um, and if not, how will that be provided? Um, I think, well, um, what we can say at the moment is is that's that's still coming in and um and what we need to monitor and how we monitor that 
you know we'll have to take on board as as the um as it sort of progresses and um we uh, the planning team monitor quite uh, a lot of aspects of development and uh, this will be another another aspect that we do um, take take on board the monitoring of along with um we do have in house uh, ecologists who would um, specialize in um in, in the monitoring of biodiversity and net gain uh, so it would be some um, some collaboration between planning and our ecologists and our green consultancy colleagues I mean, important to say, as uh, I think we said in one of the slides, delivering PNG isn't going to be just the council, uh, something that the council can do on its own. It is truly going to have to be one of those partnership working um, pieces of work. So that, that will involve not only other colleagues from within the organisation, but, um, you know, working across the county um, with colleagues from East Sussex as well. And so there'll be a lot of sort of conversations going on um, between now and, and the adoption of the local plan uh, for how we take this this work stream forward. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you both. Um, and so another question from Councillor O'Brien. How does the green and blue infrastructure strategy being developed for the plan relate to the new nature recovery strategy? And does one have priority over the other um, when developments are assessed? So, so at the moment we're undertaking the green and blue infrastructure study, which will look at green and blue infrastructure in the district um, and look at uh, nature. Um, it could provide some 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 background or some um, something to influence that nature recovery strategy. The county council will be working on the nature recovery strategy, but really that's in partnership and, and with other organisations as well. So our green and blue infrastructure study will input into the nature recovery strategy and the local plan will support that strategy um so it's the, it's the interrelation between all those um that's the study and the strategies going forward okay thank you anna i'm just going to leave it another minute um to see if there are any further questions that appear in our chat and thank you oh here we go um how much evaluation of habitat problems and um specific air, soil, noise and light problems uh, to be pinpointed? Right. All right, Brent, can you just repeat the question again? Uh, can we call it? Um, so, so, um, so if I'm understanding this correctly, it's a question from Vincent. Um, how much evaluation of habitat problems and specific air, soil, noise and light problems uh, are there to be pinpointed? Um, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of overlap with other um, other sort of um, council or, or wider um, wider bodies. We the the green and blue infrastructure study will look at green and blue infrastructure, identify where there may be um, deficits in that or or improvements that can be made. The biodiversity study looks at um, existing habitats um, and what improvements could be made. Um, so there is evaluation of, of, of some of these things mentioned um, going on. And there is also um, in relation to like, air quality, uh, we do have um, air quality specialists who look at those air quality management areas um, and the management plans. Um, and that all feeds into the local plan. Um, so there's lots of different studies that are going on in lots of different areas that all feed um feedback into the local plan which hopefully sort of answers parts of that question thank you very much indeed anna and um and and with that i think we'll, we'll draw it to a close uh thank you very much indeed everybody for attending today thank you to planning policy colleagues uh, who have been presenting. Um, a reminder that our final webinar in this series will be on uh, this coming Wednesday at midday. And as Nazim uh, mentioned, it will be on infrastructure, community facilities, design and the built environment. Um, the recording of this session will be on the website later on today if you want to watch any of it back or if you have any colleagues or friends or family with whom you wish to uh, share the recording uh, and Wednesday's um, session will be the same that, and that will be the final recording that was added to, to the website. Um, so I wish you all a very good day and uh, thank you again for attending. <laughs>